Welcome to the 10.1 notes. This is a survey of Kingdom Plantae. What we're going to be looking at here is all the characteristics of plants. Plants represent a very diverse group of organisms, but there are certain characteristics that all plants share. Plants are comprised of eukaryotic cells, meaning that they have a complex cellular structure and their DNA is contained within a nucleus. All plants are multicellular, so organisms like algae are not considered true plants because they are single-celled. Also, there are bacteria that are photosynthetic. That, of course, would make them prokaryotic, so they also would not qualify as plants. Another characteristic all plants possess is that their cell walls are made out of cellulose. And plants, of course, are autotrophic. Famously, they are able to make their own food and energy through the process of photosynthesis. Speaking of photosynthesis, of course, to review, we know that photosynthesis is the process by which plants use carbon dioxide and water and the power of sunlight to create glucose, C6H12O6, and oxygen as a byproduct. Photosynthesis is an extremely important process for life on this planet. It is the beginning of most food chains, as we saw in the last unit, and it is also an important component of the carbon cycle recycling carbon throughout the environment. Most plants possess a structure that we typically refer to as a leaf. The leaf represents the photosynthetic organ of the plant. It is a layer of tissues whose main job is to facilitate photosynthesis. The structure of the leaf has many layers, and depending on the kind of organism, the shape of the leaf is going to vary from one plant to the other. Within the leaf, you're going to find a lot of cells that have a lot of chloroplasts. This, of course, is the cellular structure that allows for photosynthesis to occur. The chloroplasts are where you're going to find the pigment chlorophyll. On the outer layers of a leaf, you're typically going to find a waxy layer known as the cuticle. This is made out of lipids that helps prevent water loss through the leaf. Within the leaves, we have to allow for materials to move in and out of the plant. So this is the job of the stomate, or stomata. These are small pores, usually found on the underside of the leaf, that allows for gas exchange, that is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide, and also regulates the release of water. The stomates are surrounded by what are called guard cells. These are cells that will open and close to regulate the stomata. Essentially what the guard cells do is they allow for the plant to control when it's going to exchange gases and when it's going to release water. Typically, the guard cells will be open when there is plenty of water. The guard cells will close when it is dry. This will help prevent water loss through the stomates. There is a trade-off that occurs within the plant leaf. In order for photosynthesis to happen, we have to be able to absorb carbon dioxide. But when the stomates are open to allow carbon dioxide in, that allows more water out. So the guard cells have to control when to open and when to close as to not allow the leaf to lose too much water and dry out. When we were discussing taxonomy, we talked about Carliolus Linnaeus, the scientist that invented the method of classification that we use today, modern taxonomy. Linnaeus was a botanist by trade, and his main motivation for coming up with his taxonomic system was to fix the utterly ridiculous method that scientists used at the time to classify plants. Plant classification during this time was an utter mess. And when we look at plant classification today, it is still pretty complicated. Plants come in a lot of varieties. There are literally hundreds of thousands of different kinds of plants, and they vary in a lot of very specific ways. So it's hard to nail down the classification of many different kinds of plants. But for our purposes, we can look at three specific characteristics. We look at the presence of vascular tissue. These are specialized tissues that are used to transport water and nutrients. This is analogous to the human circulatory system. This allows us to move materials throughout the body of the plant. Another characteristic is the presence of seeds. Seeds are pretty familiar. We think of things like acorns or sunflower seeds, but what a lot of people don't realize are the seeds actually contain the embryo of a plant. And much of what we look at with the seed is actually the protective covering surrounding that embryo. Depending on the species of plant, they will determine the nature of the kind of seed that it produces. The final characteristic is the presence of flowers. 
flowers are a specific structure of seed plants that are the reproductive structure. Flowers produce the gametes of those plants. Remember, gametes are the haploid reproductive cells that are used to combine to create a zygote. Looking at these three characteristics, we can actually get a good picture of the evolutionary pattern that plants went through in order to get to the modern characteristics we have today. Looking at this phylogenetic tree, ancient plants evolved somewhere around 500 million years ago, although there is some evidence that more primitive plants may have evolved earlier than that, but we do have definitive proof of plants existing somewhere between 450 to 500 million years ago, and they most likely evolved from ancient algaes that were also photosynthetic that contained chlorophyll-containing chloroplasts. The evolutionary pattern that we find with plants is we begin with the evolution of vascular tissue, then the evolution of seeds, and then finally the evolution of flowers. So when we category plants, we often look at the presence or the absence of those three characteristics. So we're going to take a survey of the different kinds of plant species that exist. Starting with what we classify as the bryophytes. Bryophytes are seedless, non-vascular plants. So these are plants that do not have vascular tissue, they do not have seeds, and they do not have flowers. Representatives of the bryophytes are the mosses, the liverworts, and the hornworts. Bryophytes tend to be low to the ground. Since they lack vascular tissue, they have no way of distributing water or nutrients other than through the method of osmosis. Water is transferred from one cell to the next. Bryophytes also lack roots, but they instead have thread-like structure called rhizoids that serve very similar function to roots. Bryophytes produce what we describe as naked embryos, meaning that they are the embryo of the plants that don't have very complex coverings. They may have an outer layer, but that layer is not very complex, and these naked embryos are called spores. Here are some examples of bryophytes. At the top we have liverworts, which are, tend to have broad, flat leaves, although they do tend to be very small. Mosses tend to have very tiny leaves, almost feathery in nature. And then hornworts can sometimes grow taller than your typical bryophytes, and that's because hornworts tend to be more aquatic in nature. So the reason why they can stand up without vascular tissue is because they're surrounded by water and have no need to have a complex system for moving that water. The next group of plants we have are pteridophytes, which are seedless vascular plants. So these are represented by ferns, lycopodium, and horsetails. These plants possess vascular tissue so they can grow much taller because they have a system by which water can be circulated up through the plant and the products of photosynthesis can be circulated down through the plant. Pteridophytes still don't produce seeds, so they produce spores instead. Here we have some examples of different pteridophytes, ferns being the most obvious. Ferns comprise about 90% of pteridophytes. But some other representatives we have are Myrciliae, which are sometimes called water clover. This is not to be mistaken with your shamrocks or your four-leaf clovers, because those are actually flowering plants. Lycopodium, similar to ferns, however they have these spore-producing tufts at the top. Then horsetails, which have almost a bamboo-like appearance to them, but they produce spores at the top of these stalks. Since we're looking at vascular plants now, we can talk about the vascular tissue. The majority of vascular tissue is found in the stem of the plant, and there are two main kinds of vascular tissue, xylem and phloem. Xylem are long, thin tubes that go up the length of the stem of a plant that transport water from the roots up to the top of the plant to the leaves. So the xylem is directing material up through the plant. Phloem are thin tubes that are going from the leaves down the length of the stem through the rest of the plant. The phloem delivers the products of photosynthesis, namely glucose, throughout the rest of the plant's body. The easiest way to remember the difference between xylem and phloem, if you think about phloem, phloem goes down. Think of the word flow, things tend to flow downwards, not upwards. So phloem is down, xylem is up. So the way that a plant works is you have the roots, which are an extension of the vascular tissue, deep in the ground, and they are absorbing water and minerals 
and those water and minerals move up through the plant through the xylem and eventually that water exits through the top of the plant through the stomata and the leaves. Within the leaves, photosynthesis is occurring and we're producing glucose. That glucose then gets distributed down through the length of the plant through the phloem. As I said, the roots are a part of the vascular system and roots serve several important functions to the plant, regardless of whether you're talking about a small flower like a daisy or a huge oak tree. The roots provide support for the plant anchoring it to the ground and allowing it to stand up. But most importantly, the roots are able to absorb water through the soil through the process of osmosis. The vascular system of plants plays a very important role in the water cycle, as we discussed in our ecology unit. Transpiration is the process by which water moves into the roots, then moves up the length of the plant and exits out through the leaves. The stomata open up and allow water to evaporate. As water evaporates out the top of the tree, it creates a suction through the process of capillary action. This capillary action then pulls more water in through the bottom of the plant through the roots. Remember, capillary action is a property of water. It's the property of cohesion and adhesion working together. So the way you can think of it is kind of like beads on a string. If you pull one water molecule out the top of the plant, another water molecule is going to be pulled in the bottom. And it's going to be a long chain of water molecules all the way down the xylem, creating a line of water molecules. Most of the water that is pulled into a plant actually evaporates out the top. Only about 1% of the water that the plant pulls in is actually used by the plant for photosynthesis. Most of it transpires out the top of the plant. In South America, in the Amazon rainforest, so much water is transpired by the immense amount of foliage in the rainforest that the trees themselves create clouds. There's enough water vapor evaporating out of those trees to produce their own clouds and their own weather patterns. So here we're going to be looking at the biggest and most diverse group of plants, which are called the spermatophytes. These are seeded vascular plants. These are plants that possess vascular tissue with roots to distribute water and nutrients throughout the plant. So remember the different kinds of vascular tissue are the xylem, which are transporting water from the roots up through the tops of the leaves, and the phloem, which transports the products of photosynthesis down through the rest of the tree. Here we finally have true seeds. Seeds are embryos of the plants within a protective outer covering and a food reserve. This food reserve allows the embryo to last for a very long time before it germinates. So seeds can go for years before they actually sprout and become a growing plant. This food reserve allows the plant to survive without photosynthesis for a very long time. There are two major subcategories of seed plants, what we call gymnosperms and angiosperms. And we'll look at each of those separately. The gymnosperms are what we would call cone-bearing seed plants. So these are your conifers, which would be like your pine trees and your fir trees, cycads, and ginkgos. Gymnosperms possess true vascular tissue with roots. Their leaves are often slender or needle-like. This is an adaptation to protect them from cold weather. As a result, many gymnosperms are what we call evergreens, meaning they retain their green color year round. So these are plants that generally do not lose their leaves in the fall. Gymnosperms produce what we call naked seeds. These seeds are contained in a reproductive structure we call a cone. So classically, if you think about a pine cone, this is the seed portion of the plant. Here we see some examples of gymnosperms. In the upper left, you can see examples of some different cones. What we are most familiar with in terms of a pine cone is actually the female cone. It has open spaces between the pieces of the cone, which are called scales, and this actually allows for the pollen to make its way into that pine cone. Male cones tend to be closed and tend to have smaller scales, and their purpose is to produce the pollen. So some examples of gymnosperms, you have conifers, 
which would be your classic pine trees or your fir trees, what we would typically recognize as like a Christmas tree. We have cycads. Cycads can sometimes be mistaken as palm trees, but palm trees are actually angiosperms, not gymnosperms. So cycads tend to be shorter and closer to the ground, but the giveaway trait is often having large cones at the top of the plant, as you can see in the picture. Ginkgos are a category of gymnosperm that have broad, flat leaves. They're often described as fan-shaped leaves. Famously, ginkgo biloba is often used as a herbal treatment. By far, the biggest and most diverse group of plants are the angiosperms, and these are your flowering plants. Flowering plants are seed plants that have vascular tissue. There are many different kinds of flowering plants, over 350,000 species with a wide variety of shape and form. Your typical flowers like daisies and roses and orchids, sunflowers, but also trees of all kinds. Magnolia trees are familiar in Florida, but also orange trees. Most fruits and vegetables are a form of angiosperm. In fact, one of the characteristics that defines angiosperms is that they produce seeds that are contained in what we call a mature ovary. This mature ovary is often what we describe as a fruit. What we typically describe as a fruit is a fleshy covering that contains seeds. Plants produce fruits in order to encourage animals to come along and eat those materials in order to distribute their seeds further than they might go had they just fallen to the ground. Angiosperms are further divided into two main subcategories, what are described as monocots and dicots. Here we have just a small sampling of many of the different kinds of angiosperms. We can find all sorts of different kinds of flowers, flowering plants, flowering trees, but also fruits and vegetables that we'd recognize on our dinner table are common angiosperms. Briefly, I want to discuss the difference between the monocots and the dicots. There are several characteristics that define monocots versus dicots, and it's easiest to understand them by comparing the two. So we can start off with what are called the cotyledons. These are described as seed leaves. These are actually the leaves of the embryo plants themselves. A monocot, as the name suggests, has one cotyledon, mono meaning one, and dicots have two cotyledons, di meaning two. When a monocot or a dicot sprouts, you're going to see one leaf sprouting out of the seed versus two leaves sprouting out of the seed. Then once it starts to grow, more leaves will develop from there. Another characteristic, when we look at the leaves in the developing plants, we can notice a difference in their venation, that is, looking at the vascular tissue within the leaves themselves. Monocots tend to have parallel veins, meaning all the veins run in the same direction. Dicots tend to have branching veins, meaning you have one vein with many smaller veins branching out from there. Good example of monocot leaves versus dicot leaves is look at the leaves of a corn plant versus looking at like say an oak tree. Another characteristic we can look at are the stems of the plants. Monocots have vascular tissue in bundles and that is often in a complex arrangement. So what you would often see is in the stem you'll see bundles of xylem and phloem in multiple groups versus in dicots you're going to see vascular tissue in ring formations. You can also notice a difference in the flowers that these plants produce. Monocots generally produce flowers with petals or flower parts in multiples of three. So you'll often see flowers with three, six, nine, or twelve petals. Dicots tend to produce flowers with parts in multiples of four or five. Now obviously there's some mathematical trickery you could do here. Would a flower with twelve petals be a monocot or a dicot? Well the easy solution there is to look at some of the other characteristics. What does it leaves look like? What does its seeds look like? So that would be able to determine which is which. Finally, we can look at the difference between the roots. Monocots tend to have fibrous roots, meaning that you have many small branches going out in many different directions, whereas dicots tend to have what is called a taproot. Taproot is where you have one long main root going down, 
and then many smaller roots branching out from there. Probably a recognizable example of a taproot would be a carrot. So if you think about a long orange carrot, that is actually the taproot of the carrot flower. Finally, we want to look at the main structure that denotes angiosperms, and those are the flowers. Flowers are the reproductive structure of the angiosperm. Namely, these are the parts of the plant that produce the gametes for sexual reproduction. We often recognize flowers because they are brightly colored, they produce a sweet tasting nectar, or produce some sort of fragrance. This is why humans like flowers, but this is an evolutionary adaptation to attract pollinators. Pollinators are animals of all kinds that are attracted to these flowers. Pollinators are often attracted by the scent of the flower or the promise of tasty nectar. When they interact with these flowers, they often pick up the pollen from one flower and distribute it to other flowers, in this way allowing those plants to reproduce. Famously, there are a lot of insects that are pollinators, most notably of which being bees, but other animals can be pollinators as well. Many different kinds of birds are pollinators, and many different kinds of mammals are also pollinators as well. When we look at a flower, it actually has a lot of complex structure inside of it. The petals of the flower are there to protect the reproductive organs, but also serve as a means of attracting those pollinators. You also have what is called a pedicel, where the stem of the flower connects to the flower itself, and the sepals, which is part of what is called the calyx, which is the base of the flower and the reproductive organs. We can break the parts of a flower down into male and female parts of the flower. Depending on the species of angiosperm, some will produce exclusively male flowers and exclusively female flowers, while others will often produce flowers that contain both male and female organs. The male structure of the flower is what is known as the stamen. This has two parts, the anther and the filament. The filament is just a long stalk that holds the anther up, and the anther is actually the part that produces and distributes the pollen. Pollen is the male gamete of the flower. The female organs of the flower is known as the pistil. The pistil is comprised of three components, the stigma, the style, and the ovary. The stigma is a sticky opening that leads down through the tube-like structure called the style to the ovary of the plant. The ovary produces the female gamete called the ovule. Ovule is just another word for egg cell. Depending on the species of angiosperm, the ovary may produce a single ovule or it could produce many ovules at once. If you cut into an apple, you'll find many different seeds versus if you cut into an avocado, you're only going to find one large seed. And this concludes our survey of Kingdom Plantae. Have a good week and good luck on your assignments.